How many of you um, remember back in the 90s when Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa were battling it out for breaking the home run record in baseball? You remember that? Yeah, it was really fun. It was amazing because like, you know, the old record was like 62 home runs and, and they were nearing 70. They were getting close to 70 and it was so exciting. Like every game that you watch with Mark McGuire and you're like, is he gonna do it? Is he gonna hit another home run? You know, and most of the time he would. Uh, but what was funny about it, or what was interesting is, you would look at the man, you would look at his body shape, and you would go, something's not natural about this. And guess what? There, there was something not natural going on. Like, he looked like a cartoon character. His upper body was just, like, huge, and he looked like one of those characters off of Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. You know, this is like <laughs> this cartoon character, you know? Yeah. Like, this, this can't be natural. Well, come find out he was using human growth hormones. And so was Sammy Sosa, although he denies it still to this day. Um, but come on, Sammy. Yeah. We saw you when you came in. You were a skinny rail, and then your body type totally changed. I'm just saying. <laughs> but you weren't doing anything. Okay, all right. You know, and, and the thing about it, the sad thing about it is, yeah, they broke the home run record. But guess what? There's always going to be an asterisk next to their name. Of, yeah, they broke the home record, but they cheated, you know? Uh, and there's going to be an asterisk next to other people, you know, Pete Rose, because of his gambling thing, you know. Uh, there's going to be, an, I believe there's going to be an asterisk next to Bill Belichick, even though he won all these Super Bowls. You know, he's been caught in so many different things. He, they were caught taping the other team and their practices, learning their signals. That was the first red flag. And then there was deflate gate. There's like too many things going on in this team. You know, it's just something's not right. Uh, Bill Cosby, you know, I used to love his shows. He made great shows, right? Guess what? Nobody respects the man anymore. Why? Lack of integrity. Ruined all that. Ruined his legacy. Gone. In contrast, let's, let's have a good example. This is a movie. How many of you have seen the movie Walking Tall? There's been several versions of it. I like the, the, the rock version with Dwayne Johnson, Johnny Knoxville. Uh, it's just a great story. You know, and what happens is he comes back from the military and he comes back to find his hometown has been corrupted, right? And, and this guy who owns a casino and, and, you know, they're cheating at the casino, ripping people off. They're pushing drugs from the casino into the community. The, the police officers are corrupt. They're being paid to look the other way. And the rock comes in and he's like, oh, no, not in my hometown, right? Not in my hometown I'm gonna clean this up and he runs for sheriff and he takes over and he meets a lot of resistance against those bad guys but in the end he wins and I'm just like you go rock you take over you clean up the town I loved it man I love that story it's just something about integrity good integrity that inspires us right so last week uh, you know here's the thing integrity matters if you don't have integrity what's gonna happen you're gonna get a bad reputation in town People aren't going to want to be friends with you. Um, people aren't going to want to date you. Uh, people aren't going to want to do business with you. And then God's looking down and he's not pleased. And so, you know, but on the flip side, if you are a person of integrity, God looks down and he is pleased. And I'm going to tell you this morning, there are many blessings and advantages that come your way for being a person of integrity. We're going to talk about those today. So last week, we talked about a uh, person of integrity is trustworthy. Can people trust you? One of the areas we looked at is, can they trust you to do a good job at work, even when no one's looking, even when the boss isn't around? Are you still doing a good job? Um, a, a person of integrity is honest, yeah. honest. And when you say you're gonna do something, what did Jesus say? Let your yes be yes, yes and your no be no. no. If you say you're gonna do something, if you say you're gonna be somewhere, you need to do that, you need to be there. People, people need to learn to trust you that, that you mean what you say. And, and we used to say in the older generation, my word is my bond. People could count on you. You know, some people say, if I don't have my word, if people can't count on my word, I have nothing, right? That was an older generation. I think we need to bring that back. Um, we need to be honest and admit when we make mistakes. That's hard because that means we got to drop our pride. And that hurts. It hurts our pride. But admit when we make mistakes and then honest in our business dealings. Um, and this week we're going to look at some other areas of integrity. So 1 Samuel chapter 24. Let me tell you about David. David, King David from the Old Testament, uh, he was not a perfect man. He was not, we know that. But 
if you look at his overall life, I definitely think he has a life worth emulating, worth copying. Um, this man was a man of God. He loved God, and he tried his best to live for God. And when he made mistakes, he owned up to it. We talked about that last week, but I just continue to be impressed with this man. First Samuel chapter 24, verse 1 says, After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. Think about it. He took 3,000 men to look for David. You think he was serious about trying to take this guy out? 3,000. I mean, that's crazy. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. This is such a funny story to me. David and his men were where? Far back in the cave. That's where they were hiding. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands and for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the, the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. Now watch it, Saul's response. When David had finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. He cried. He broke down crying. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? Nope, not usually. May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. People of integrity make it a goal to always do what's right. In fact, that's the meaning of the word integrity. In the Hebrew, the word integrity means moral innocence. It means this person tries to do the good things and tries to stay away from doing the bad things. Moral innocence. They do what's right. So let's talk about what a person of integrity looked like by looking at the life of David. First of all, people of integrity play by God's rules for life. People of integrity play by the rules. When I was a kid, I got in two fights that I remember pretty well. The first one, I was in fifth grade. There was a kid named Chris Gerke, and we were out on the playground. And I'm telling you, I did nothing to this kid that he should start picking on me. But for whatever reason, he just starts coming up and causing me trouble, you know, and, and hit me and, taking me and he took me to the ground. And somehow in this tussle, I got on top of him. Now, I don't know what possessed me to do this next part. 
But I decided while I had him on the ground to grab his nose and just start twisting it. <laughs> and he goes, oh, oh, my nose, I have allergies, I have allergies. And I was like, well, you shouldn't have messed with me. <laughs> Next thing I know, I feel yanked off of him. I'm, I'm just flying up into the air. I turn around the custodian, the janitor, had yanked me off and broken up the fight. Another fight I got in, this guy, in, it was in junior high, seventh or eighth grade. Uh, this kid named Jim Myers. He, again, I didn't do anything to him. I didn't even know this guy before this happened. I literally did not know him. He comes up to me. He starts picking troll. He starts causing troll. And, and he takes a swing at me. And just out of like reaction, I take a swing back and just barely glance off his cheek. The janitor breaks in there, breaks us up. Man, thank God for the janitors of the world. You know what I'm saying? Like doing above and beyond what they're paid to do, you know? So uh, I go to the, so I go to the principal's office by myself and the assistant principal says, Jeremy, you got nothing to worry about. I talked to all the witnesses and they all said that it was the other guy who started the fight and you actually tried to not fight him. So you're off the hook. You can go. now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. See, I tried to do what's right. I got let off the hook. Justice was served. But people of integrity play by the rules that God has given us. David has been chased all around the countryside by Saul. Like over and over and over. He just will not stop. He's tried to kill David multiple times and all because he was jealous. That's it. Jealous. Only reason is he's jealous because the people respect David more than they respect him as a king. Which he wasn't a very respectable person. That's why David was. So just out of sheer jealousy, he's trying to kill him multiple times. He finally gets the opportunity. You end up in a situation where you have the perfect opportunity to kill this guy. My question for you is, what is the right thing to do in this situation? What would you do if you were in his shoes and you had the opportunity? In this case, the rule was, you don't touch the Lord's anointing. Amen. That was the rule that God had put down. David knew that what it meant to be the anointed one is when someone was placed as king, they would literally anoint them. They would pour oil over their head to show this is God's chosen person, right? And so David knew God chose this person. Who am I? It's not my place to take him out. That's God put him in place and God will take him out of place. I just, I'm amazed by his reaction. And so integrity, can I tell you, integrity is about doing the right thing even when you don't feel like the other person is doing the right thing. That's integrity. And I want to I just do a quick little side note about respect the office even if you don't respect the person. So in the Old and New Testament, there was this principle that you respect the office. You respect who, you know, the, the position even if you don't respect the person in there, and I'm going to say something real quick and then, then just leave it, is you already know where I'm going, don't you? Politics. Politics. So listen, it doesn't matter who got elected. The people on the other side are going to do nothing but run that man down for the next four years. I don't believe we need to do that. I think, God, we need to respect the office even if we don't respect the person. Leave it alone. All right. Um, I want, to, I want to talk about how he left revenge up to God. I think this is so key. David left revenge up to God to handle, didn't take it into his own hands. There was this uh, truck stop restaurant kind of place, and uh, this man was sitting down, he was eating his meal, and this first guy walks by and he, he puts a cigarette out and the guy's mashed potatoes. Oh man. The second guy, the second guy, his buddy walks by and, and he spits in the guy's milk. The third guy walks by and he turns over his plate, knocks the food over. The man who's eating there, he just he doesn't say anything. He just gets up and walks out of the restaurant. So this other guy who witnesses all this happening, he goes, he says to the waitress, he goes, not much of a man, is he? And she said, no, he's not much of a truck driver either. He just backed his truck over three motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to what David said. We read it, verse 12. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. Watch this. In two chapters later, 26, verse 8, Abishai said to David, 
Today, God has delivered your enemy into your hands. A second time, he had the chance. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't strike him twice. In other words, it's only going to take me one strike. I will kill him. But David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come and he will die. Or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. So again, he says, nope, I'm going to leave it in God's hands. David's like, the Lord will take care of him. Revenge is not mine to take. David plays by God's rules. Guess what happens? In the end, a neighboring country attacks Israel and Saul dies in battle. David didn't have to lay a finger on him. And he can, have, he can sleep with a clear conscience. God took care of it. David didn't need to take it into his own hands. I love hearing stories of people who play by the rules like, like the walking tall character, the rock. They fight an honest fight. They play an honest game. And truth and honesty and integrity win in the end. I love those kinds of stories, don't you? I'll tell you another thing about people of integrity. They do what's right despite the advice of others. See what I'm doing up here? Yeah. You know what I'm talking yeah. about. People talking in your ear. Sometimes, you know, how many of you know, sometimes people give the wrong advice. <laughs> so it happens. They give the wrong, you can hear the people now to David, can't you? <laughs> David's companions are like, man, here's your chance. Like God has laid him out on a silver platter. This is your chance. He's been trying to kill you multiple times. He deserves death. Just take him out now. But does David listen to the voices of others? No. He says, no, I'm going to do what's right. I don't care what y'all are saying. And it would be hard not to give in to that, though, wouldn't it? It would be hard not to give in. You've heard the voices, haven't you? Go ahead and steal his stuff. Nobody's looking. He's a jerk anyway. He deserves to have his stuff stolen. Have you heard those voices? When it comes to drugs, alcohol, sex, friends say, everybody's doing it. It won't hurt you. I found a loophole in the law. You don't have to claim that. I found a way around it. The government rips us off anyway. They don't deserve your money. All right? Have you heard the voices? Everyone cheats on tests nowadays. It's not a big deal. Besides, we're helping each other. That's a good thing, right? We're helping each other. I saw this episode on the Today Show where they interviewed kids. And apparently that's a thing where younger people don't feel like it's wrong to cheat on tests anymore. They say, hey, we're helping each other. So that's a good thing. Can I tell you? If you're hiding stuff, you know it's wrong, don't you? <laughs> Come on, you, you know it's wrong. Oh, you wouldn't be hiding if it wasn't wrong. Uh, I recently heard a story, you know, peer pressure is real, isn't it? Peer pressure is real. And so when you hear someone who stands up to the peer pressure, it's awesome. I heard a story about a high school football player who was a Christian and he was well-built and really athletic and he helped lead his team to several victories and won all kinds of awards and everything. And, um, and so this, this, this uh, local newspaper heard about it and they came and interviewed him. And uh, the lady said, you know, I, I know I've heard that you're a strong Christian. She said, it must be hard not to give in to the peer pressure, you know, when you're a Christian and maybe everyone else isn't. His response, ma'am, I am the peer pressure. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. I am the peer pressure. What are you talking about? People of integrity. People of integrity. I'll tell you another thing they do is they, they do what's right despite the bribes of others. Despite bribery, whether that bribe is fame, fortune, or power, it takes many forms. The person of integrity says, nope, I'm, I'm not taking your bribe. I'm going to do the right thing. A Psalm of David, Psalm 15, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who does right living, who lends money to the poor without interest and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Does not accept a bribe. In Chicago, 1929, a 26-year-old government agent named Elliot Ness took position and formed an elite team of nine incorruptible men to bring down Al Capone's $120 million mob empire. At the time, catch this, 
Ness was making $2,800 a year. Just hold that number in your head, 2,800. This guy walks into his office with an envelope. The envelope had two $1,000 bills and said, if you will lay off the poem, you will get this amount weekly, $2,000 weekly. He gave the envelope back and he said, you, you take it back and tell him no deal. Next day, wanting to make a point, he calls all the news stories and he told him the story of what Capone tried to do. In the next line, the headline read, Ellie, uh, Ness and his men are untouchable. Untouchable. You can't touch me with those bribes. Modern day bribery. Do we still have bribery going on today? Oh my, oh my, yes we do. It's ridiculous. We got, you know, people trying to buy off judges, lawyers, police officers, um, you know, police officers like in the movie Walking Tall, if you'll just pretend you don't see this drug deals going on and this corruption and just, you know, trying to pay somebody off. Listen, if somebody said to you, I'll give you money, I'll give you, what would motivate you? $10,000, let's just go with that. If I give you $10,000, will you just pretend like you didn't see anything? What would you do? What would you do? Um, have you ever tried to bribe somebody and say, hey, if I stick this money in your pocket, will you just not write me a ticket? <laughs> you know, uh, bribery still happens. What are we gonna do? Are we gonna be the people of integrity? And then let me tell you something. If we are the people of God, and people of integrity, there's a couple things, good things that are gonna happen. Are you ready for this? Are you ready? Yes. So integrity is shocking and can be used as a witness. It can be used as a witness. David's friends had to be shocked. They probably didn't understand at all. Like, what do you mean? He's, he's on a silver platter, he's right there, take him out. They didn't understand. Even Saul didn't understand. Did you catch that? He's like. When your enemy is right there in your hands, do you let him leave without harm? No, you, you kill your enemy, right? Even Saul is shocked. And when your friends ask why you didn't do something wrong, you have an opportunity to say, I didn't do that because I'm a follower of Jesus and I try to do what's right. And you get to be a witness. Yes. And I believe that's what happened when Paul and Silas got arrested and thrown in jail for doing nothing wrong. But they're thrown in jail. How many of you know the story? They're thrown in jail and they're singing hymns to God and praying. Like, what? <laughs> the other, other prisoners are like, why are they singing? It seems like they're happy. Why are they happy in here? They're singing songs of joy. Like, these people are crazy. They've lost their mind. No, they know the peace of God. Um, but I love what happens next. So an earthquake, God causes an earthquake to happen. All the doors fly open. But, and, and this part isn't in there, but I just imagine the conversation that happened. I imagine that it happened this way. The doors fly open. Paul says, hey guys, everybody just stay where you are because this jailer is going to get executed if he lets us all free. And, and, and I don't want him to be executed. And by the way, I want a witness to him. So just, just stay here, right? So he sees the jailer about to kill himself because he knows I'm dead anyway. These guys are gone. He just assumes they've all left, right? I would have too. And Paul says, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And I imagine the jailer going, what? Are you serious? You're still here? Why? Why are you still here? I would have ran. Right? And, and Paul goes, because we're followers of Jesus. And, and we got something to tell you, by the way. We want to tell you the good news of Jesus. And do you know what happened that night? They told him the good news. And the jailer and his whole family were baptized into Christ that night. Come on. Why? Because integrity, that's why. Because integrity. He did something different that was shocking, and because of it, he had an opportunity to witness. And that's what we need to be looking for. We're going to see that jailer and his family in heaven someday. We're going to be like, oh, that's the jailer. Because Paul chose to be different from the world. And then the second thing that happens because of integrity is God blesses people of integrity. Is anybody looking for God's blessing this morning? Amen. All right. 24:19, David uh, Saul told David, "May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king, and the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands." 
for doing the right thing. Isaiah 33, watch this. Isaiah 33, 15 says, He who walks righteously and speaks what is right, who rejects gain from extortion and keeps his hand from accepting bribes, who stops his ears against plots of murder and shuts his eyes against contemplating evil, this is the man who will dwell on the heights, whose refuge will be the mountain fortress. His bread will be supplied and his water will not fail him. What's it saying, in other words? When you're a person of integrity, God's going to bless you. He's going to take care of you. Yes. And then Proverbs 20, verse 7. you got to love this one. The Proverbs says, The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his, what? Children after him. Do you want God's blessing in your life? Do you want your children to be blessed after you? Then live a life of integrity. That's where it's at. So I hope that you will choose to be different from the world and live a life of integrity. To do the right thing no matter what. No matter what others are talking in your ear. No matter what others might offer you as a bribe. You will do the right thing. And if you will live in, with integrity, the Bible says you will be blessed. And you might even get a chance to be a witness for Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Amen.